Extending a thousand miles from south to north, Sweden is rich in scenic variety. From the wide plains of the south, the country reaches into the lake and forest region of central Sweden and north to mountainous Lapland, where in midsummer the sun never dips below the rugged horizon. The province of Skona in the south is aptly called Sweden's granary. The whole region is an unbroken sweep of fertile farmland. While today only 30% of Sweden's population is engaged in agriculture, production has trebled in the past 50 years. Sweden's farmers have taken advantage of all the 20th century offers in the way of scientific agriculture. Skona is also Sweden's chateau country. Long ago, the nobility and landed gentry lived in these castles, which were built from the 14th to the 17th century. In many cases, descendants of the original owners still live in these castles, managing their large farms and breeding cattle and fine horses. Skona is graced by many quaint medieval towns, and along its coast are modern seaside resorts and picturesque fishing villages. From Malmo, Skona's provincial capital, ferries leave for Denmark, only an hour and a half away. As for us, we take this motor road to Kalmar on Sweden's east coast. The great castle of Kalmar, begun in the 12th century, was once called the key to Sweden because of its strategic position in medieval times. Swedish railroads, which are mostly electrified, are swift and efficient. A modern train speeds us to Gothenburg, second largest city of Sweden, its gateway to the west, and the country's largest seaport. Sailing, steam, and motor vessels leave here for ports all over the world. Logically, Gothenburg has become the shipbuilding center of the country. It is also the home port of the Swedish-American line. King Gustavus Adolphus in the 17th century brought Dutch architects to Sweden to plan the city and its canals. Attractive modern housing with the emphasis on sunlight and pleasant surroundings is characteristic of Swedish cities. And so is the abundance of restaurants, which are quiet and spacious and offer a great variety of tasty meals. The Swedes are connoisseurs of fine food and their serving of it is a long practiced art. Even the preliminary dishes in a Swedish meal are many and appealing. From Gothenburg, by train or by auto, we reach the province of Vermland and visit its lovely old capital, Karlstad. It's a typical provincial town, bright and sparkling, for part of Sweden's charm is in her appearance of fresh scrubbed cleanliness. Every town has its Stats Hotel or City Hotel. This splendid hostelry in Karlstad is a fine example of similar establishments to be found in all parts of Sweden. Sweden is laced with rivers, canals, and lakes. And of the many boat trips, the most famous is from Gothenburg to Stockholm by the Gota Canal. The boats serve as comfortable floating hotels as they make this leisurely three-day journey. They are raised by some of the locks to almost 300 feet above sea level. A stop is made at Vadstena, noted for its fine 16th century fortress. Incidentally, St. Bridget, patron saint of Ireland, was born in Vadstena. 
Since 1750, this part of the country has been famous for its lace, and the delicate art has been carried on by the women folk to this day. The canal trips are popular, and rightly so, for no other means of transportation affords quite such an intimate contact with the countryside and the daily life of the people. The peaceful quality of the country seems magnified. Sweden's quiet beauty is all about us, close at hand. Rising from many islands linked by bridges and with water everywhere, Stockholm is one of the most ideally situated of all national capitals. Greater Stockholm is the home of nearly a million people, about one-seventh of the country's population. The building across the water is the city's largest and newest hospital. Stockholm's town hall, finished in 1923, is considered one of the finest modern structures in all Europe. From its tower, we see the island which was once the whole of Stockholm and is now called the Old Town. Its cobbled streets and alleys are characteristic of the Middle Ages. Just across the narrow waterway is the bustling traffic of the modern city. To get a good picture of Stockholm, we ride up the Katarina Elevator, located in the southern part of the city. At the top, we find a restaurant where we can enjoy not only our meal, but also a fine view. Before us lies Stockholm, the queen of the Baltic. This cloverleaf approach to southern Stockholm solves a difficult traffic problem. And across the water, another glimpse of the ever beautiful and impressive town hall. Now down again for a closer view of some of the things that must be seen in this lovely city. Traffic keeps to the left, and there are lots of bicycles in Stockholm, hundreds of thousands of them. There's always a friendly policeman to direct visitors to the points of interest. To the royal palace, for instance, the Stockholm residence of the king and the royal family. The daily changing of the guard at the royal palace is a tradition of long standing. The House of Parliament is a reminder that Sweden has had a National Assembly for more than 500 years. The trim little steamers in front of the Grand Hotel carry commuters to and from island summer home. This is the famous Royal Dramatic Theatre. There across the park is Stockholm's public library. And here, the concert hall. Before it stands the statue of Orpheus by the famous sculptor Carl Millis. The market square displays produce of delectable variety. Summer days in Sweden are unusually sunny and long, so fruits and vegetables develop high color, large size, and excellent flavor. These are cultivated berries, but all over Sweden grow delicious wild strawberries. Flowers grown in Sweden are remarkable for their fragrance, and because the climate is so moderate, the blooms remain fresh and brilliant for a long time. 
The Swedish love of flowers is apparent everywhere, as in the many open-air restaurants. Yes, indeed, flowers are everywhere. They play an important part in Stockholm city planning. Free recreation centers, wading pools, and playgrounds are scattered throughout the city. Evidence that one of the brightest features of Sweden's social program is child welfare. The Swedes are enthusiastic about outdoor life, and they take to it early. Grown-ups are well provided for, too. Within Stockholm city limits, there are many public swimming pools and beaches. Stockholm's outdoor museum, called Skansen, is a 10-acre park dedicated to the mode of life and traditions of old Sweden. The buildings are ancient structures brought here from the provinces. Here at Skansen, the old handicrafts are kept alive and traditional costumes are worn. There are daily programs of folk music and folk dances. From Stockholm, there are several excursions to be made in the archipelago and back into Sweden's past. For example, to Gripsholm Castle, which dates from the 16th century. It has all that we expect to find in an old castle, but its importance today is that it houses one of Europe's finest collections of historical portraits. Another medieval castle, this one in the ancient town of Uppsala. Here is the seat of Sweden's oldest university, founded in 1477. Some of the dormitories add a modern touch to the university. The cathedral at Uppsala is the largest church in Scandinavia. It is the resting place of many persons illustrious in Sweden's history. The climax of these excursions into Sweden's past is the overnight voyage to Visby on the island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea. Visby was the home of the ancient Goths and is the only remaining walled town in northern Europe. In the long ago days of the Hanseatic League, the town was rich and powerful. The remains of 11 medieval churches, as well as the Great Wall built seven centuries ago, reflect Visby's past glory. Outside the city walls is one of Sweden's most modern and most popular seaside resorts. We leave Visby by air, and at Stockholm we see the arrival of a transatlantic plane of the Scandinavian Airlines system. From here one can fly to any part of Scandinavia and we shall wing our way to Lapland, Sweden's northernmost province. Over the rich timberland of central Sweden, over myriad lakes and rivers, we approach the Arctic Circle. Beyond the Lap Gate lies Lapland, a region of turbulent waters and rugged mountains, where the glowing beauty of the midnight sun prevails in midsummer for seven weeks. The Laps are not of the same race as the Scandinavians, although they make good Swedish citizens and their children are educated in state schools. Most of the Laps are still nomads like their ancestors for many generations, following their reindeer and their seasonal migrations, and dressing and living 
in the old ways of their forefathers. In summertime, while their reindeer herds are grazing up in the mountains, the Laps often act as guides for tourists. By the electric train from Lapland, we turn south again to that beautiful part of Sweden known as Norland. It is a region of immense forests, vitally important to the national economy, as timber and wood products form the basis of Sweden's largest export industry. The preservation of the forest is safeguarded for future generations by an enlightened conservation program. Sportsmen from all parts of Sweden and from other countries too come to Norland to hunt and to fish. In the twilight of the northern summer night, the train speeds southward and we enter Dalakalia, called the heart of Sweden. It is a province of white birches and sparkling lakes, of old churches and splendid farms, of colorful costumes and traditional handicrafts. It is the most picturesque part of Sweden. In Dalakalia, native costumes are generally worn on Sundays and festival days. Students come from all parts of the world to Dalakalia's weaving schools, where they master the craft and study the traditional designs. This old craft is cherished in Dalakalia, and the designs persist through generations. Wood carving is another handicraft that flourishes in this province. This veteran wood carver is a master of his craft. His pride is a village wedding group. In Dalakalia, weddings are gay occasions and often take place at midsummer. On Midsummer Eve, June 23rd, the season is celebrated with much rejoicing and gaiety. From miles around the people come, some on foot, some in their farm wagons, which have been gaily decorated for the occasion. Others row across the lake from nearby villages in their old-fashioned longboats. Fiddlers play the old folk tunes of Sweden, taught afresh to every generation. Each village has its lofty maypole decorated with wreaths and birch branches. For young and old, it is the gayest festival of the year. Throughout the long twilight hours, the merriment goes on. Today, this old kingdom is a modern country. Yes, but in many ways it remains picturesque Sweden. 